I'm Ryan. And I'm Zach. And together, once again, we are functionally literate. Only when together. On- <laughs> as soon as we part, we're like, what do these words say? It's good to have you back, Zach. I missed <laughs> you. It's been a long time. Yeah. Oh, it's been good, though. For, uh, for posterity, you took your hiatus, but the episodes have still been coming out. Yes. And so from the audience's perspective, the hiatus is going to happen in a month. Right. <laughs> we yeah. still got uh, Chinese and Japanese mythology. Those episodes are going to come out. And then uh, got eight episodes of the fifth season. Took eight episodes to cover that with Julia, which she's great. I think it would be nice if the three of us could get on for a podcast sometime mm-hmm. to like do book club with three people. That would be cool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but today we, you and I, are covering Les Mortes de Arthur again. We're doing the third story, book three, The Wedding of King Arthur and the adventures that resulted from that day because it was uh, it was quite a day. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the establishment officially of the Knights of the Round Table. So that's a th- the interesting thing. I didn't <clears throat> realize that like it wasn't already established. Mm-hmm. Like I just assumed. Nope. <laughs> It hasn't been a thing yet. Wasn't a thing. Now, this is the story that makes it a thing. So, without further ado, let's get into it. How King Arthur took a wife and wedded Guinevere, daughter to Leo de Grouts, king of the land of Cameliard, with whom he had the round table. So, in the beginning... You know, Arthur was made, you know this part, Arthur was made king by pulling the sword from the stone. None but his barons knew that he was son to Uther Pendragon, as Merlin made it openly known to them. And many kings who didn't know of Arthur's lineage, and honestly, they probably wouldn't have cared even if they did. They probably wouldn't have have been like, nah, fuck you. Uh, They're going to shoot their shot at the throne, just to be sure. Right. So they went to war with him over him being crowned high king, and... Arthur overcame them all, and Merlin was his trusty advisor, and that's why he overcame them, because Merlin had the power to see the future, right? He was a dream reader. Yeah, exactly. You love that. (laughs) It's such a good insult, because it makes no sense. Be we advised to heed the words of a dream reader? (laughs) Nay, I say. (laughs) Well, so anyway, so, so... One day, King Arthur, he goes to Merlin, and he's like, My barons will not stop pestering me. They say, I must take a wife, but I will take nobody's advice but you on this matter. Which makes sense. Yeah, it's fair. I mean, if you got to pick one guy to listen to. The, Merlin's worked out pretty good so far. For him, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. So Merlin, you know, he's like, It would be good for you to take a wife. For a king should not be without a wife. Now, is there any that ye love more than another? And Arthur's like, yeah. I love Princess Guinevere, daughter to King Leo de Grains of Camliard, who keeps in his castle the table round given to him by my father, Uther. This damsel is the most valiant and fairest lady living that I know of, or that I could ever find. And Merlin, he's like, uh, sir... I cannot deny that she is the most beautiful and fairest alive, but if you did not love her nearly as much as you do, I should find you another damsel whose beauty and goodness that would please you. But your heart is set, and when a man's heart is set, he is loath to return. There was little else to say on the matter. Merlin, you know, he spoke it plainly. He's like, hey, I don't think this is a good idea, but clearly you're not going to be dissuaded. Yeah, so, so in my version, he specifically says... That Guinevere is ill destined, yeah, and that she is destined to love Lancelot mm-hmm. and he her. So mm-hmm. he's like, "You can marry her. I mean, you're the king. You do what you want, man. If that's the wife you want, I'll go get her for you. But mm-hmm. like, she's not gonna love you the way you want. Right. You want your wife to love you. Yeah. So in my version, you know, <laughs> like you know, Merlin says that, and Arthur's like, "That is truth." And then Merlin is like, "Listen." She she's her heart is is with another, you know, and then it's at this point that he tells Arthur the tale of the Sangreal, which is not going to happen for a while. Mm -hmm. And we are not uh, told that story at this time. We're just told that Merlin tells Arthur about it. Yeah. 
And so then, you know, Merlin asks uh, King Arthur for men to go with with him, with Merlin, to Camelard to speak with King Leo de Grains of Guinevere. And so, you know, Arthur granted Merlin's request, and Merlin traveled the slow way to Camelard and spoke to King Leo about his daughter. So, I don't know why he didn't just teleport like he always does, but I guess he wanted, like, a, an entourage for appearance's sake or something. Yeah, it. when you're going to someone to propose to them that... Uh, Hey, we'd like to make your daughter the high queen of all England. Yeah. There's some to do about it. You know, <laughs> that's not something you just like, hey, by the way, yeah. is it cool if that... if Arthur marries your daughter? Like, this is going to be a big thing. It's very, um, it's a huge honor for her father mm-hmm. and her. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they want to give like due reverence to what is happening. And also, I think Merlin wanted to give Arthur time. Yeah. To really consider, like, is this really what you want to do? That would make sense. Because if he just, like, popped over, did it, came back, no, and no, like, no, no, all right, no, no. Give me your s- wife. Give right. me your daughter. We're all set. <laughs> then Arthur could, like, a day later be like, I don't know, man. I've been thinking about what you said. <laughs> and it's like, well, it's too late to take back now. No take backs. Yeah. He already so agreed. He's like, we're going to give him a couple weeks. Yeah. And if I don't hear from him by the time I arrive. Yeah. I guess it's fine. So yeah, he he uh, travels with an entourage to uh, King Leo. That's what I'm gonna call him because Leo de Grains is it's a long name. It's, a, it's an awkward name. It's elegant, but it's long. Yes. So King Leo, he was over the moon when Merlin told him, "Hey, King Arthur would like to marry your daughter." He was like, "This is the best news I've ever heard." The High King to wed my daughter, and I'll give him my lands. I know it will please him, although. I know that he has plenty of land. He doesn't need more. Hmm. I shall give him the table round, the same one that his father gave me. I shall also gift him 100 knights. His father gifted me 150 knights, but I fought and slayed 50 of them. So 100 will do. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so, yeah, King Leo gave Guinevere to Merlin, as well as the round table and 100 living knights. And they rode as a royal procession until they reached London. So I told I told my wife about this, and she was not impressed by the gift. She was like, she was like, she was like, honey, we have a round table. That's not impressive. Like, why is that so impressive? And I was like, it was a really big table. Yeah, it's important to remember it sits 150 people. <laughs> yeah. That's a big table. She was like, nah, fuck that. King Leo de Grains is a shit. He is re-gifting. <laughs> In a way, it, it could be seen as a kind of inheritance. Right. It's it's this gift was from Uther. Uther never knew Arthur, um, never got to meet his son. And so Leo de Grants in this way is sort of being like, look, this is what's already rightfully yours. Mm-hmm. But what do you give the high king of England? It's like he technically owns everything in England already. already. Yeah. So it's not like, oh, I'm going to gift you this. He's like, that's technically already mine. I'm going to give you something with sentimental value. Right. So he's yeah. like, all I have is sentiment. I can give you that. Because mm-hmm. it's kind of to his point. He's like, I can give you land, but like, I'm a, I'm a king, but you, you're the high king. So you already own so the land. So this is technically your land anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I just love that... He's like, I would give him 150 knights, but I already killed 50 of them. He's like, yeah, 50 are already dead. Oops. Because we've been fighting in war. Now, (laughs) what would be interesting is if those 50 died during the war with the five kings in service to Arthur. So I interpreted it as over the years he was dueling them to the death. That could also be true. (laughs) (laughs) It could also be true. They died in like tournaments and jousting or Mm. something like that. Anyways, moving on to chapter two. How the Knights of the Round Table were ordained and their sieges blessed by the Bishop of Canterbury. So King Arthur, he receives word that Guinevere and a hundred knights and his father's round table was on their way. So, you know, he was thrilled. He was not expecting such grand gifts. I don't think he was expecting anything. Yeah. So Arthur called for the most honorable wedding and coronation that could be made. And then he told Merlin to go and find him 50 worshipful knights of high prowess. He was like, they got to be Christian and they got to be badass. Merlin could only find 28. 
<laughs> the the thing is, I'm sure there were plenty of other Christian knights. Yeah. I'm sure there were plenty of other badass knights. Yeah. I'm not sure there was a lot of overlap. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the real problem. That's it's the like, real problem. All right, all the Saracens are out. Yeah. We can't have we can't any of those guys. Fuck those guys. Yeah. No Saracens. <laughs> yeah. So, and then it's like, well, all the monks out. Yeah. They're terrible knights. <laughs> so we need Christian knights that are badass. Anyways, so so the Bishop of Canterbury, he was called for, you know, and he he blessed the knight and he granted them sieges, which I looked that up. That means they were given seats of distinction. So I think if I'm understanding that right, like this was like the beginnings of the forming of the Knights of the Round Table. Now that Arthur had the table or was about to have it. So my understanding is traditionally every seat at the Round Table Mm -hmm. is referred to as a siege. Mm Okay. Now, they would also typically come with, we would assume... Uh, and I think it's stated later towards the end of this story, an earldom, a duchy, a barony, some kind of lordship, Mm -hmm. some land, because as sort of a PR thing, you don't want some impoverished hermit sitting at your table of, these are the grandest men in the land. You know, like... You don't want Balin. Right. You don't want a poor guy. No, no. (laughs) You're like... That's for after, you know, <laughs> like you, one day if you retire from knighthood and you want to go be a cloistered monk, that's totally cool, man. But while you're here, we have a reputation to uphold. We have a certain image we're trying to portray. So you have to have you need a, you need land. A, you you need have to have them. You need an earl. <clears throat> you need something. Right. Yeah. You got to have something with it. So. <laughs> Sorry, I just I just can't let go of the fact that Merlin could only find 28. <laughs> well, and. This comes to really a thing about how Merlin operates is, could Merlin really only find 28? I don't know. Or did Merlin just know who was going to fill those other seats? And he's like, I can't find anybody better than them now. So we're just going to leave those seats empty. That's a point. Until someone comes in that I know is going to fill them. Because at this point, like, Sir Gawain is not Sir Gawain yet. He's just Gawain. But he is arguably one of the most, if not the most famous knight of the round table. For reasons that will come up later. So he's not in the hundred knights that were gifted to Arthur that already have yeah. seats at the round table. Yeah. So some of those empty seats are saved for these like heroes to be. Makes sense. Well, so anyways, so, you know, the art, the archbishop was called to bless them and he did. And then Merlin told all the knights to stand up and go to King Arthur and pay him homage. So, you know, they did. And then Merlin put on each seat of the round table, one of the knights' names in gold lettering. Two of the chairs were left blank. So then young Gawain, son of Margossi and the late King Lot, so he's Arthur's nephew, he asked the king a gift, which means a favor. He wanted, you know, he wanted a favor. And Arthur's like, ask. And so he's like, sir, I ask that you make me a knight the same day you shall wed fair Guinevere. And Arthur's like, I will do it with good will and give you all the respect I may, for I must by reason you are my nephew. I don't think that's um, fully accurate here. Like, his reasoning, I mean. Mm -hmm. Because we got to keep in mind, yes, Margasi (laughs) is his sister, but they also had an incestuous bastard together, Mordred. And then a few years, you might recall, a few years back, there was an incident called May Day where he shipped off all the babies born in May to die at sea. Never let that go, folks. I'm just Keep remembering. <laughs> Keep remembering. He did that. I'm, I'm just saying there might be more than <clears throat> simple familial ties that are... that are <laughs> Could be some guilt associated <laughs> with it. Just a little bit. Yeah. Just, yeah, no, I'm never I'm never letting that go. That, that happened at the beginning. It did. It did. So, yeah, he agreed. He was like, I'll make... Yeah, I'll make you a knight on my wedding day. Sure. Yeah, so uh, it was a tradition... When kings had a reason to celebrate, typically it was their wedding or the wedding of a yeah. close family member um, or even like a funeral of somebody, to grant requests, it was always specified that any reasonable request yeah. would be granted. Yeah. And so it was a way to sort of bring the peasantry into the celebration. Because mm-hmm. it's like, if I'm just, you know, a dirt poor farmer that's a half notch above slave 
mm-hmm. work in the land for some lord that I've only seen twice in my life. I don't really care if he's getting married. Nah, fuck it's that It's like none of my damn business. Right. I have bigger problems. You know. But when he says, hey, anyone that comes with a reasonable request will be granted it. Mm-hmm. Now I'm interested. Mm-hmm. Now I'm going to take the day off work. I have some requests, okay? Yeah. It'd be yeah. real nice to have like new clothes. <laughs> and I could just get that seems super reasonable. I could just get that. Just new clothes. Yeah. I don't yeah. have to pay for it. Just the king will just pay for a seamstress to give me some new clothes. Right. That'd be great. Which he could definitely do. Yeah. Or he could just be like, you know what? Here's a bunch of stuff I was gonna throw out anyway. <laughs> have that. And you're like, hell yeah, brother. Yeah. I got some free clothes. Yeah. <clears throat> Anyways, moving on to chapter three. How a poor man riding upon a lean mare decided King Arthur to make his son knight. So this poor man comes into the court with his 18-year-old son in tow, riding in on a thin horse. This horse is not being fed very well. And he asked everyone he saw, where shall I find King Arthur? And one of the knights told him, yonder he is. Do you have business with him? And he's like, yeah. That's why I came here. <laughs> nope, just wanted to know. Thanks, man. <laughs> Being my starving horse will move on. So he goes to King Arthur. You know, he salutes him and he says, Oh, King Arthur, the flower of all knights and kings, I beg Jesus, save you. Sir, I was told that since you're getting married, you would grant any man a favor so long as it was reasonable. And Arthur's like, that is true. I have said so, and it will be so, so long as the favor does not weaken my realm or my estate. And the poor man's like, you say well and graciously, sir, I ask nothing else but that you make my son here a knight, and claps his son on the shoulder. And Arthur's like, you're asking quite a lot. What's your name? Yeah, so this is where it gets a little fuzzy in that <laughs> in that qualification of reasonable. Right. Um, because with knighthood comes a certain amount of prestige Mm -hmm. and notoriety, Uh also responsibility Mm -hmm. and expectations, but not just anybody got to be a knight. And so for a random peasant to just come up and be like, hey, make my son a knight, it's like, that's actually a pretty big ask. (laughs) What you're asking me to do is take this very poor kid and give him leadership over lots of people and space. And make him rich. Right. Yeah. For no reason other than... You asked. You asked? Pretty yeah. please? Like, that's a lot. <laughs> yeah. So he's like, so yeah, so he's like, that actually might be a little too much. What's that your might name? be unreasonable. And he's like, sir, my name is Ares the Cowherd. And, and Arthur's like, does this request come from you or from your son? And Ares is like, my son, not I. I tell you... I have 13 sons, and they will all do whatever work I give them, and they're always glad to do it, except this one. He will always be shooting darts or making them and obsessed with battles and knights. Day and night, he asks me, Daddy, Daddy, please make me a knight. Nothing my wife or I do can dissuade him. And Arthur, you know, looks at the young man, and he's like, what's your name? And he's like, sir, my name is Tor. And Arthur quickly, you know, looked him over. He had a handsome face, and he was well-built for his age. So he turns to the cowherd, and he says, Fetch all your sons here, so that I may see them. Ares did as he was asked, goes back home, brings back to the court all of his sons. The court saw that all of his sons, except for Tor, was built like him. Tor was taller and larger than any of them. Mm. Yeah, so I'm just imagining this, like, impoverished, anemic family. Right. That, like... They're not starving, but they're probably pretty close. Right. You know, they're not eating real well. They're all a little scrawny. They're cowherds. And then you have Tor, who's just this like Adonis. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he's just got this perfect like bodybuilder, Superman jaw. Yeah, yeah. And he's yeah. just like, make me a knight. And his dad's like, please make him a knight. Please. I don't know what's he's going on just, with this kid. He but, like, doesn't, he won't cowherd. <laughs> these other 12 kids do everything I tell them to do, and they do it well, but this this little shit is off playing sword fight in the woods, and I don't know what's going on. Shooting arrows, making arrows, right. riding his horse all fucking day. Yeah, and you know those 12 brothers resent him so much. Probably. They probably you want him to, to be a knight so they can get rid of him. Yeah, they're like, just get him <laughs> out of here, Dad. I'm tired of looking at his stupid, handsome face. Yeah. So, so Arthur says, 
uh, to the cow herd. He's like, where is the sword he shall be made knight with? And Tor's like, here. And he gestures to his weapon. And he's like, take it out of the sheath and ask me to make you a knight. So Tor dismounted from his horse. He unsheathed his sword and he kneels before Arthur. And he asked him to be knighted and to be a knight of the round table. So like right at the knighting. Yeah. He's like, please make me a knight of the round table. And so he's like, as for that, Arthur's like that. He's like, as for that, I will make you a knight. And took Tor's sword and touched it to each side of his neck. And he said, be you a good knight. And I pray to God you may be. And if you have skill and worth, you shall be a knight of the round table. Now Merlin, say if this Tor shall be a good knight or no. And then Merlin drops a bombshell. He's like, he ought to be. He is of king's blood. And Arthur is looking at him. Like, how so, sir? Because he knows he didn't father another child. Yeah. <laughs> and Merlin's like, I shall tell you, this poor man, Ares, is not his father. He has no relation to him. King Pelinor is his father. And Ares is like, nah uh <laughs> A fair response. And then Merlin's like, fetch his mother then. She'll say otherwise. And I told my wife this, and she was like, Merlin! He's just stirring the pot. <laughs> He's just, he He's really just stirring is. the pot. Yeah. So now this is like my favorite part, at least of the beginning, like before the wedding. Uh huh. Because then the wife comes. Yep. And she's like, "All right, Merlin's telling the truth. The day before I got married, mm-hmm. this night that I don't know showed up, and in my version it says specifically and." convinced me to the act of love with no little force. My version says that she was milking the cows one day and a stern knight <laughs> met her and half by force had her maiden head. Yeah. Yeah. So you're just like, this is a this is precarious rape. situation. This is, this is not precarious to me. This is rape. <laughs> that lady got raped and then he took her greyhound. Yep. He was like, To remember her by. To remember her by. He's like, I'm going to take your dog. Yeah. All right, Zach, check this out. This ad, this episode is brought to us by someone. Okay. This episode is brought to you by the Greg Bush for House District 50 campaign. Greg Bush is a registered nurse, nurse's advocate, proud union member, husband, and father, who has called Columbia home for 18 years as of this May. I know him from church, and I co-starred with his wife in a Maplewood Barn production last year, The Crucible. She played Tichiba. I played Reverend Hale. Um, And now he, uh, Greg, is running for House District 50, which is in southern Columbia. He worked his way up the ranks at MU Healthcare and put himself through school to become a registered nurse after starting as a janitor in 2006. He's running as an advocate for patients and nurses since he's been on the front lines of watching the outcome of extremist politicians in Jeff City. He has three children, one a graduate, with two children still in Columbia Public Schools. He will be a fierce advocate for public education in Columbia. As a member of a working family, he already has the endorsement of two of the largest unions in Missouri since he's a union member and has been for nearly a decade. Check him out at Greg Bush for House District 50 on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Please consider voting for him in November. And if you can't vote for him because you don't live in House District 50, uh, consider donating to his campaign. I have an Act Blue link that will be included in the episode description. Back to the show. Like, what the fuck? And so then, yeah, she had tour that year. Yeah. And and the cow herd's like, I didn't know that, but it makes sense. He never he never had no touches of me. So so this guy was never taxed. Pelinor mm-hmm. never taxed him. Mm-hmm. Like that was that was the thing. It was like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna bang your fiance, I'm gonna take her dog, and in return, I'm not gonna tax you. No taxes. No taxes. It doesn't seem to be doing him all that much. Mm-hmm. favors with how skinny he and his horse are. He does have a, like, now, a dozen children. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> to be fair, family goals. I'd love to have as many kids as possible. <laughs> but 
12 seems, I mean, that just seems unreasonable in the amount of time frame you have mm-hmm. to have kids. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. so, yeah, it's uh, it's very awkward. I think in my version, the the quote father's. Uh, response was, "I wish it were not so." Yeah, <laughs> I wish it <laughs> he was just very plainly was like, "Well, I wish that didn't happen." I wish that didn't happen, but I guess it did. So, so this is um an awkward situation, right? Because like it's just been revealed that Tor is a bastard, and that uh, you know his mom had a child out of wedlock. Under normal circumstances, that would be bad. Yes, that would be very bad. And so Tor he begs Merlin not to dishonor his mother. Yeah, that was the other thing is it comes like as soon as this has come up um before the mother has like fully confirmed that uh Merlin was telling the truth, Tor was like you dishonor my mother and was going to fight yeah, Merlin. Yeah. <laughs> and then the mom was like no 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 no, it's right, it's true. Yeah. Listen, it's the truth. It's the totally truth. Totally Pelinor's your dad. It's, yeah. It's Pelinor is your dad. <laughs> <laughs> so he's like please Merlin don't dishonor my mother and Merlin's like if anything this does more good than harm because Tor's father is a good man. No he isn't. And king and might even advance him and his mother because this all happened before she was married and the wife is like that is truth. And the husband's like it is the less grief unto me. That's all he's got to say about it. Yeah, he's like, I guess that makes it a little bit less. Like, it wasn't, (laughs) she wasn't my wife yet. I think, honestly, like, there's a lot of people that get screwed over in this story we're going to tell. But, like, Ares is an honorable mention. Like, Yeah, the thing is, we have no reason to think he is somehow not a good person. Right. He's just, he's just a guy. He's just a regular guy. He, he works hard. You know, he's got... 13 kids to feed and i'm sure tor eats more than the other 12 combined oh, he fucking definitely does he's, you know he's it, huge yeah and he's barely making it <laughs> like his horse is almost dead <laughs> and yet for the sake of his oldest son he goes to petition the king for knighthood yeah which he's like, 100% I could get murdered just for asking this. Mm. Under any other circumstances. Yeah, but I'm totally going to do it anyway because I love my kids. Yeah. And I'm a good dad. Yeah. Does it anyway and gets, you know, I mean, his the, what he gets in return is like, JK, not even your son. <laughs> it reminds. Your wife was like basically raped. You know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's yeah. like, oh. Like, no, 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 but it's good because she wasn't your wife yet. And he's like, okay. All right. I mean. It is the less grief unto me. Like, what else cool, are you going to say? I guess. Like, uh, he's in front I of all these it, royals. I wish it were not so. <laughs> <laughs> this it, poor man. This whole thing with, like, people coming to Arthur for, like, gifts, it reminds me of this episode of Scrubs. Did you ever watch that show? I love Scrubs. Okay, so Don't watch, like, the last season, season like, the teaching hospital stuff. No, no, Don't watch this. The ninth real season, bad. just pretend it doesn't exist. Yeah, just, but in one of the earlier seasons... There was a, do you remember that there was an episode with Bob Kelso? He was the guy that ran the hospital. Yep. And he once a year gets laid. And but you know, like he doesn't have sex often, but like once a year his wife will have sex with him. And that week he will be over the fucking moon and he'll like he'll accept any request anybody makes yep. of him. Yeah. It reminded me that. of that. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, moving on. Next chapter. Chapter four. How Sator was known for son of King Pelinor, and how Gawain was made knight. So, we've established all of this. The next morning, King Pelinor comes to court, and Arthur was delighted and told him of his son Tor, and how he had knighted him at the cowherd's request. <laughs> Pelinor beheld his son, who he didn't know existed until now, yep. and was pleased. And then Arthur knighted Gawain and honored Tor at the feast. And then Arthur asks Merlin, why are two seats empty at the round table? And Merlin says, sir, no man shall sit in those seats except those of most worship. But in the siege perilous, there shall no man sit there but one. And if there be any so hardy to do it, he shall be destroyed. And he that sit there shall have no fellow. So saying, Merlin took Pelinor by the hand, and led him to the two empty seats and the Siege Perilous, which I imagine is a third larger empty seat, and (laughs) said to the room, This is your place, and best ye are worthy to sit here in any seat. 
So I want to talk about the implications here. Mm -hmm. He's saying whoever sits in this seat is screwed. And then he takes Pelinor by the hand and is like, sit there. So in my version, there are, at the outset of this, there's three seats that are empty. There's the Siege Perilous Mm -hmm. and then the seats on either side of it. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, Arthur's like, what's this about? And he says, Siege Perilous is saved for one person. When that one person shows up, he will get to sit there. Anybody else that sits there, they're fucked. Right. Don't let it happen. The one next to it, almost as bad. Uh Uh-huh. Like, when that knight shows up, his name will just automatically appear on the table. You'll know that's his seat. He can sit there. The third seat, the one next to Siege Perilous, he says, that's for Pelinor. Oh, okay. So Pelinor is like the steward of Siege Perilous. Okay. He's to sit there until the man that is going to sit in Siege Perilous arrives. That makes more sense. I was very confused reading this bit. Yeah, it gets the the syntax of Thomas Mallory's a little tough to yeah. understand sometimes. Yeah. Well, so anyway, so <laughs> Sir Gawain sits in his place feeling envious. Yeah. And then he tells his brother Gaharis, he's like, that they laud that knight and it pisses me off because he slew our father. I will slay him. And his brother's like, you will not at this time. I'm only a squire now. When I am made knight, I will be able to avenge him. Therefore, brother, it is best you suffer till another time when we can get him outside the court. We would trouble this feast if we did anything now. And Gawain's like, fine, fine, I will suffer, as will you. Yeah. And that's that. They're, they that's both that are just kind of like, we fucking hate this guy. Fuck this guy. He killed our dad, yeah. and he's a rapist. <laughs> this is not good. And Gaharis is like, you don't fuck up this wedding, okay? We're yeah. both, you just got knighted. You wait till I get knighted. We'll get that guy out in the woods somewhere, and we'll take care of it. But for now, shut the fuck up. Hey, they learned their lesson, <laughs> right? Like, everyone, so everyone knows what happened to Balin, right? That's right, yeah. Like, people yeah. know better now. You don't, you don't just decapitate people in front of Arthur. He gets very upset. He, he really doesn't like that. <laughs> he's like, this is not... What I wanted out of you guys. <laughs> he has never been shamed so much in his court, and he never will again. That's right. That's <laughs> Moving on. Chapter 5. How at feast of the wedding of King Arthur to Guinevere, a white heart came into the hall, and thirty couple hounds, and how a bratchet pinched the heart, which was taken away. This is when the shenanigans happen. That's right. So... So the feast was prepared. The king was wed to Guinevere in St. Stephen's Cathedral. It was very solemn. Like, honestly, the book says almost nothing about the ceremony. Yeah. It's Wait. it's a solemn ceremony. It's a it's a wedding. <clears throat> yeah, we've you've, all been to a wedding. We've all been to weddings. They are long and boring, and I'm sure when they're, when they're royal weddings, they're even longer and more boring. Yeah. But, but with all the regalia, you gotta yeah. make it hoity-toity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Anyways, the reception where now the shit talking. goes down, yeah, <laughs> consistently. The part of the wedding everybody wants, right? So, you know, everyone <laughs> sat down where they were supposed to be, and then Merlin he approaches the knights of the round table and he's like, "Sit still and don't move. Some strange shit is about to go down." And so the knights, understandably, they knew to listen when Merlin said such things. Mm-hmm. He's, uh, you know, he's got a reputation nowadays. Yeah, so. As Merlin said, some strange shit went down. A white deer, a snow white deer, came running into the hall with a white bratchet next to him, which is a, I looked it up, it's a female hunting hound Mm -hmm. known for its nose. So a white deer followed in by a white hound comes storming in, and then behind them, 60 black hounds, which I assume 60 because it said 30 couple. Mm Mm-hmm. So 60 yep. black hounds come running in, barking up a storm. Like, imagine that. Like, yeah. just, just out of nowhere. Yeah. Just all of these dogs mm-hmm. chasing a deer. Just ruining everything. So the deer runs around the round table, and then the bratchet bites its ass and rips a chunk off of it. And so the deer leapt up in shock and knocked the knight over. The knight rises up, mounts his horse, leaving with the bratchet to chase after the deer. And then right then, a lady rode in on a white palfrey, which is like a 
highly valued riding horse during this time. So, mm-hmm. yeah, so this lady rides in to the reception on a horse and cries out to King Arthur, Sir, suffer me not to have this despot, for the bratchet was mine your knight led away. So I think she's saying, forgive me for the inconvenience I've caused. Yeah. And he's like, I will not do that. <laughs> well, so so what she's saying is uh, it would be dishonorable yeah. to her yeah. to let that knight take her bratchet. Right. So she's like, don't let this happen. Like, get that knight back and mm-hmm. give me my dog. And mm-hmm. he's saying, no. No, you're ruining my wedding day. Right, he's like, I, I can't. I can't do that. He's gone. What right. do you want me to do? Yeah. <laughs> so then another knight comes riding in, well-armed on a great big horse, and he forces the lady to come with him, and she cries out in sorrow, and Arthur, he doesn't give a shit. He's glad to be rid of her. She was loud and annoying, and she yeah. brought in a bunch of fucking dogs. That's right. <laughs> And Merlin's like, don't dismiss this so lightly. You must bring them all back or they all will have greatly disgraced your wedding, which is a point. Yeah, no with that. And so Arthur's like, I will do as you advise. And so then Merlin's like, call Sir Gawain. He must bring back the white deer. Also, you must call on Sir Tor to bring back the bratchet and the knight went after her or else slay him. Also... You must call on King Pellinore to bring back the lady and the knight who took her or else slay him. These three knights must do this or else come back. And so King Arthur did that. He called on all three knights to do as Merlin bid him. Each took up Arthur on the quests he gave and armed themselves. So this is where the story gets interesting. None of the other stories have been like this. So now the narrative is going to split and we're going to focus on one knight at a time. Yes. So... In the next chapter, we turn to Sir Gawain's adventure because Merlin named him first. Yeah. So before we move on, yeah. these are the, the two things that I really wanted to home in on as, as symbolism until we get to the end. The white stag, the white heart, yeah. the white deer. Yeah. Heart is just an archaic term heart. for stag. Yeah. So it's a, a male deer, antlers. The whole, oh, it is? Yes. Oh, it okay. is specifically male. Um, in Celtic mythology it's typically symbolism for like male virility mm-hmm. and so it this could be sort of a nod to like arthur being married right it's like you're now married now th- there is also some symbolism there with stags and royalty or sovereignty their antlers being a kind of crown they're sort of king of the woods and so it coming in to Arthur's court makes sense. The white stag or the white heart is going to appear a lot in yes. Arthurian legend. Like there's a lot of them. Arthur several times tries to hunt one, fails every time. <laughs> Can't get it. Okay. Um, now the fact that it's white implies purity. Mm-hmm. Um, also in in Celtic mythology, stag specifically can symbolize like otherworldliness, mm-hmm. the mystery of like the fairy people or mm-hmm. the other world. Mm-hmm. Um, in Christian symbolism. It tends to more often denote, like, religious aspirations and fealty. Okay. And so, because the Arthurian legends is this very interesting mix of Celtic and Christian, Yeah. there's probably quite a bit of depth to the character that is the White Heart. So what's the significance of the Bratchet? Bratchets, being hunting dogs, uh, tend to, as dogs in most cultures, represent loyalty. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, but the Bratchet, the female hunting hound, specifically... Also Snow White. Also White, purity. Mm-hmm. Um, tends to uh, lean itself more towards the interpretation of like conjugal fidelity. Hmm. So it's interesting that Tor, the bastard son, is sent after the symbol of marital... Uh, Loyalty. Huh. That recontextualizes his adventure. Because his, I'll be honest, I wasn't very impressed by his adventure. But it's, I think it's shorter and less impactful than the others. Yeah. Um, but it's also important, like, Pelinor was not sent no. after the conjugal fidelity <laughs> symbol. He sent after the woman. Right. Right. Okay, that is interesting. Okay. Right. Anyways, chapter six. How Sir Gawain rode for to fetch again the heart. And how two brethren fought each against other for the heart. 
So this chapter I thought was pretty funny, if I'm honest. Mm -hmm. So Sir Gawain, he rode quickly with his brother Gaharis, who rode with him in place of a squire to assist him, which, you know, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So as they rode, they came across two knights fighting on horseback. <laughs> so Gawain and Gaharis, they stopped between the two knights and asked them why they were fighting. And they were like, we fight because we are brothers, the younger knight says. And Gawain's like, yes, but why? Like, right. w why, though? Yeah, <laughs> which it's important to note that Gawain is there with his brother, right. Gaharis. Right. So he's like, that doesn't make any no. sense. <laughs> so, we're also brothers. We're not fighting. Right. <laughs> so the older knight is like, sir, a white heart went this way today, followed by many hounds, and a white bratchet was next to him. We understood it must have something to do with King Arthur's feast. So I wanted to go after the deer to win great worship. But my little brother said he would go after the deer, claiming to be a better knight than me. So we started arguing and decided to fight to prove who was better. Boys. This is a very relatable argument. <laughs> this is very... Do you have I a have, story? I have three brothers. I have so many stories <laughs> that are just this exact argument. <laughs> so, so Sir Gawain says to the brothers... This is a simple reason, which I think means this is a dumb reason. Yes. You should do this with strangers, not your brother. But if you will listen to me, I will fight you. And you will lose to me. And you will go to King Arthur and do as he tells you. And the knights, they're like, sir, we've been fighting already and we've lost much blood. We should like not to fight you. And he's like, then do as I say. And they're like, we will. But who should we say sent us? And he said, the knight who was sent to retrieve the white deer. Now, what are your names? So the elder knight introduces himself as Sorluz of the Forest, and the younger introduces himself as Brian of the Forest. Mm -hmm. And so then they left for <laughs> Arthur's court, and Sir Gawain continued on his quest. He followed the howling of the hounds and comes across a great river that it appeared the heart had swam over. So Sir Gawain, he starts to cross, and then he sees a knight standing on the other side. And this guy's like, Sir Knight! Don't come over here after the white heart unless you wish to joust with me. And Sir Gawain's like, I will not fail my quest over that. So he made his horse cross the river, and then they charged each other full on. And Sir Gawain knocks the other knight off his horse, spins back around, and says to him, Yield! And the guy's like, Nay, you may best me on horseback, valiant knight, but I pray you dismount, and we shall fight with swords. Who are you? Sir Gawain asks. And he's like, Alardin of the Isles. And so they arm themselves with swords and shields and they slash at each other. And Sir Gawain slashes so hard he went through Alardin's helmet and stabbed his brains. And so that knight falls dead. And uh, Harris, Harris, he's like, ah, that was a mighty stroke of a young knight. And that's the chapter. Yeah, he's just kind of, he's like, dang, you're pretty good at this, man. Yeah, like he crosses, like he makes his horse cross a river, which is exhausting. And then yeah. he wins a joust. Yeah. I don't know uh, what the point of that chapter was, to be honest. I really think it's just setting up Gawain as like, hey, he's this really good, sure. talented, powerful knight. Yeah. It's just showing that like, he has an intimidating presence. He does. He's skillful. Yeah. Um. He's not afraid to fight. Character development, you allege. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Moving on. Chapter 7. How the heart was chased into a castle and there slain. And how Sir Gawain slew a lady. So, Sir Gawain sucks. This chapter establishes, yeah. in my opinion, that he sucks. I'm going to lead with that. Yeah. Yeah. So... So Gawain and Gaharis, they're you know they're chasing after this heart. Um, they and the heart ran into a castle. I don't know which castle. It doesn't say. It's a random castle. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. Six of the Greyhounds, I think six, because it says three couple, which uh, that's such a weird way. Like why don't you just yeah. say six? Why don't you just say sixty? Whatever. I don't know. So <clears throat> six greyhounds chase this heart into the castle and they kill it in the chief place of the castle so i looked that up i think it means that's the great hall they killed yeah. it in the great hall yep yeah. so caharis and sir gawain found the hounds devouring the deer and then a random knight enters sword in hand and he kills two of the hounds and chases out the rest 
And so on his way back to the great hall, he says to himself, Oh, my white heart, me repenteth. That means I'm sorry. That I re me repenteth that thou art dead, for my sovereign lady gave thee to me, and evil have I kept thee. And they death shall be dear bought, and I live. So... So I put I phrased it that way like that's a quote because I'm not fully certain what he's saying here like I get that he's sorry for killing the deer because his lady gave it to him but like I don't fully understand the other half. Read it again. So he's like me repenteth that thou art dead for my sovereign lady gave thee to me mm -hmm. and evil have I kept thee and they death shall be dear bought and I live. I think he's, it's just expressing his regret that the heart is dead, but he isn't. Mm. He's like, you know, like, it would have been better that you had lived and I had died. So, I get you. you know. Because his lover gave that to him. Right. Well, so so he goes back into his bedchamber <gasps> and arms himself for battle. And he goes back into the Great Hall. And he was met by Sir Gawain, who was pretty upset. And he's like, why have you slain my hounds? They did but their kind. I'd rather you had wrought your anger upon me than upon a dumb beast. And the guy's like, you say truth. I have avenged myself on your hounds. And unless you go, I'll do the same to you. I love that. <laughs> That's so good. Gawain's just like, bro, the dog's just doing what dogs do. Why are you so mad? <laughs> And he's like, you know what? Fuck your dogs and fuck you too, bro. Get out of my home. Get out of my home. <laughs> so Sir Gawain, he, he dismounts his horse, which by the way, they're bringing horses into the Great Hall. Well, you never know what you're going to find in there. <laughs> and besides, he's chasing a deer. He's like, yeah. I can't match a deer speed on foot. I need the horse. Well, so anyway, so Sir Gawain, he dismounts. He, you know, he arms his sword and his shield and... And then they, you know, they fight. They strike each other. They batter each other's shields. They bash each other's helms with the pommels of their swords. You know, they're going all at it. They break the chains of their hauberks, you know, those chainmail shirts. Mm -hmm. They they break the chains well enough that body blows caused blood to run down their bodies and drip off their feet. So they're really fucking each other up. And then mm -hmm. finally, Sir Gawain strikes the knight so hard that he falls to the ground. The knight calls mercy and yields. He begs for his life. And, you know, he, you know, he wanted to live, he, you know, and, but Sir Gawain, he's like, ah, thou shalt die for the slaying of my hounds, which, man, they're not your hounds. Like, I don't know. Yeah, they but, sort of just showed up. Right. But he's like, he's very possessive of these hounds. He's like, you shall die for killing dogs, just doing dog things. And he's like, I will make amends. Unto my power, I shall make amends. And Sir Gawain doesn't give a fuck about amends. He he unlaces his opponent's helm so he can strike his head off more cleanly. Mm -hmm. But then the knight's lady came out of the same bedchamber that the knight had come from. And he sees Sir Gawain taking off the helm and raising his sword high above his head. And thinking nothing of herself, she drapes her body over her lover. And Sir Gawain cuts off her head by mistake. The book says, by misadventure. Yeah. So in, in my version, it, it very much specifies that Gawain did not know that she was there. Mm -mm. He was already beginning the stroke mm -hmm. when she jumped in the way and mm -hmm. that he could not stop it. Yeah. And so it just sort of happened and he was like, oh, shit. Yeah. So then Gawain's brother, Gaharis, he's like, that is foully and shamefully done. That shame shall never leave you. You should give mercy unto them that ask mercy, for a knight without mercy is without worship. So he's just like, bro, where's your honor? Like, what yeah. the fuck? What the you guy doing? yielded. Yeah, he did. He did. Yeah. He's like, mercy, I yield. Mm -hmm. So at his brother's shaming, Sir Gawain attempts to fix things. But he was so indifferent about the lady he killed that he didn't understand the offense he brought to the knight when he said to him, arise, I will give thee mercy. And this knight's like, nay, nay, I will accept no mercy now, for thou hast slain my love and my lady that I loved most in the world. And Sir Gawain is like, me sore repenteth it. That means I'm very sorry. And he's like, I thought to strike you. But now you shall go to King Arthur and tell him of your adventure and how you were overcome by the knight that went in quest of the white heart. And this guy's like, I don't give a toss wherever I live or die. So, you know, in his anger, he swears to go to King Arthur. So he tossed the body of one greyhound onto his horse and ties the other onto the saddle to drag behind him. And Sir Gawain's like, what is your name? 
And this guy's like, my name is Ablamar of the Marsh. And then he leaves. That's the end of the chapter. And I'd like to note here that it was this chapter when I was telling my wife this story where she's like, I don't want you to tell me these stories anymore. <sighs> She's like, I, she's like, getting real I, sick of these ladies dying. Basically, yeah. yeah. She was like, I am sick of these women being playthings for knights that never ever get their proper desserts. I'm tired of it. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> well, spoilers. Yeah. The title of the story is Le Mort de Arthur. Right. They will all get what they deserve. Right. <laughs> Maybe not in the way that you would hope. Right. Maybe not in the way you think most just, but it doesn't end well. And this is a tragedy. And so this is where we're going to end this episode. But I will say to draw you in for the next episode, Gaharis, sorry, Gawain, he fucked around this episode. He's going to find out next episode. That's true. So just something to look forward to. So we're going to wrap up. That was uh, the first seven chapters of out of 15 of this story we're gonna do the other eight next chapter next episode rather um i want to thank chris d mooney for being our audio recordist he set everything up for us we just walked in and started thank you chris thanks chris Uh, i want to thank vidwest studios for providing nearly all of our equipment and a space to record i want to thank jake weller for uh doing our music for the episode um Thank you, Zach, for coming back. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank yeah. all of you. Yeah, thank you guys, thanks, guys for listening. Yeah. Yeah. Check out our Patreon. Check that out. It's a dollar. It's a dollar. What is it? Is that a dollar an hour? It's a dollar a day? It's, it's a dollar a month. It's one dollar every month? <laughs> that's an insane deal, guys. That's so that's so good. I would do it. <laughs>